Hi, everyone. This is Jason Birak of Wall Street for Main Street. Welcome back to another Wall Street for Main Street podcast interview. Today's special guest is a returning guest. He's former Silicon Valley executive. He was a corporate lawyer, worked on Wall Street for a little bit as well. Louis Camersano of Small Gold, thank you for joining me again. Hi, Jason. Thanks for having me on. Now, Louis, I last had you on in March. Uh, it's been quite a while. So we normally do this about every three or four months. So what's your opinion now on the global macroeconomic situation with what the central <laughs> since then well clearly what's happened what a lot of people said would never happen was the fed is making moves towards raising interest rates and not just one and done and not just uh symbolic rate hikes they're relatively significant by now i mean they're at 1.75 which means they've raised rates seven times they raised once in 2015 at the end of the year once at the end of 2017, uh, 16, a few times in 17, and a couple of times now in 18, and they're looking to do a couple of more, they're saying. Now, all those rate hikes, most of them happened since Trump was elected, basically all of them other than the one they did in 2015. They did one in 2016 at the end of the year. And what the Fed is basically saying between the lines is, Monetary policy has gotten us out of this mess. We had a financial crisis in 2008-9. We took emergency measures. We took interest rates down to zero. Uh, we did three rounds of QE. We increased our balance sheet from under a trillion dollars up to four trillion dollars. And we're done with that. Now, concurrent with being done with that, the, the Congress has embarked on fiscal policy stimulus. And the idea now is that the economy still needs one form or another of stimulus. Either it's monetary stimulus and what the Fed does, <coughs> excuse me, or the fiscal stimulus in the tax cuts. Now, one of the theses I've had all along with what the Fed was doing was all during the 2008 and 2009 period when the Fed was doing QE. Remember, Japan had wasn't doing it. Um, Euro European Union had never done it. And that's when you had all this talk of dollar collapse and China getting really worried about what was happening. And a lot of countries that were holding U.S. treasuries were concerned. They're like, what are you doing? You're just printing up all this money and you're bringing the rates down to zero. And this is helping you more than it's helping us. And but since then, the dynamic has changed dramatically because when the United States finished, the day they finished QE, Japan announced they were going to do their QE, which they're still doing. They have negative rates, I believe, and they're purchasing just about every bond uh, that Japan issues. And then months later, uh, the ECB embarked on its own QE, which now, if I'm not mistaken, in total nominal terms is larger than the United States, what the Fed did. I think it's at $5 trillion, their balance sheet. And also the tenor of what the ECP has done is different in that it is corporate bonds they're buying a lot of, not just the, the sovereign bonds. The ECB has also said, and they're still at zero interest rates, has said they're going to keep those rates there probably until the end of 2019 and that they would probably stop the QE at the end of 2018, which means that when all is said and done, the QE for Europe will be have been even bigger in size, and they'll have had zero rates for probably longer than the U.S. did, and the same with Japan. Now, I believe these, these central bank machinations are coordinated. It's no coincidence that Japan started their QE after the U.S. did it, and there's no coincidence that the ECB, for the first time, started theirs in early 2015, I believe. And that was at the prompting, I believe, of Vice Chair Fisher, who had been uh, had mentored Mario Draghi, who is the head of the European Central Bank. So I think what they're doing is they're trying to keep, if the dollar was the centerpiece of the new financial system since Bretton Woods, they can't allow the dollar to be look like it's the most reckless central bank. It does stimulus. It has zero interest rates. 
the others had to do the same thing. So on a relative basis, the dollar looks good. And that ties into why the dollar index has really, since they stopped QE, has gone straight up. It went down a bit in early 2018, but it's back up. Uh, where is it now? I mean, it's like it, uh, it's over almost 95. It had at one point gotten over 100. But the point being is, is that I think that in order for the fiat currency system to work, they have to have they have to take turns. So the U.S. went full on QE, full on low interest rates. They stop. Japan starts. ECB stops. China never stops. <laughs> and then uh, now it looks like the Fed is going to get another two interest rate hikes in. And the Bank of England finally hiked rates for the first time. And at some point, I'd imagine that the ECB is going to raise rates at the end of 19. And just around the time that the ECB is ready to start, quote, normalizing its interest rates. Well, by then, the U.S. may have interest rates at 2.5%, 2.75 possibly. And they'll probably, it's no surprise, the United States hasn't had a formal recession. By then, it'll be in 10 years that they probably will have a recession in the United States and they'll have to start cutting rates while Europe is doing the reverse and then is raising rates. And the same thing probably with Japan. So I think it's all coordinated. I don't think they could all go all in on QE, all go in on negative interest rates, all at the same time. Yeah, I agree with you. I, I think it's definitely coordinated, at least to a certain extent. We don't know the exact amount. We do know that there was enormous amounts of currency swaps during the financial crisis. My sources told me that there was enormous currency swaps for the U.S. to the European Central Bank for years after that as well. And what you brought up with the European Central Bank, the balance sheet expansion, they weren't even supposed to be doing QE at some point. That changed with Mario Draghi. Uh, a little bit more than five years ago with it with his whatever it takes on a napkin speech and then not too long after that they went into massive qe and now like you said their balance sheet is more than the federal reserves at least the publicly stated balance sheet of the federal reserve mm -hmm. also the bank of japan's balance sheet larger than the federal reserves as well the people's bank of china's balance sheet much larger than the federal reserves balance sheet and, and that's why and, and that's why I, i'm i'm fascinated when people are still talking about end of dollar hegemony, all this talk about dollar collapse, the dollar is clearly the one that's at least trying, is, is, is on the other end of the under under the cycle, I mean, they're in a tightening mode. It's, it's kind of perverse. It's kind of perverse. It's it, it, the dollar. It seems to me, Lewis, you can correct me if you disagree with me on this, but it seems that the dollar has ended up as like the U.S. economy and the dollar has ended up as the best economy in like a bad neighborhood, the best house in a bad neighborhood scenario. Yes, and if the whole neighborhood is the whole financial system, it doesn't take a genius to see which one actually has positive interest rates and which one isn't doing QE. That's the Fed. But people have it in their mind that the U.S. or the Fed is the reckless entity when. Well, it's it's all relative, right? Because in my that's opinion, the point. Yeah, yes, if we if we it's all relative. So you and me both agree the Fed is reckless, too. But the market is perceiving right now, even though we may not agree with this, our listeners may not agree with this. The market is perceiving the Fed is less reckless. Well, it is less reckless. I mean, when you're raising interest rates and you're doing nominal trying to decrease your balance sheet when the others are increasing their balance sheet it is less reckless i mean to have four trillion in outstanding on the balance sheet you would say is reckless yeah. they've already done what i'm saying is they're not engaging in that same behavior as they have been and a lot of people said the fed could never raise interest rates they've proven them wrong and a lot of people said well they can't ever really normalize them well possibly but i don't think all the people who said they could never raise them and if they do raise them it'll be one and done and after they raise them one or two times they said the next move is negative rates and then qe that's been proven wrong they're they've done they've raised the rates it's not a it's not a myth it's not like uh they're faking it they actually have the fed fund rate is what one seven five to two well, I want to correct you a little bit on what you, your statement you said about the dollar, because the dollar has gone up and down rallies quite a bit the last couple of years. I believe in 2016, the dollar was rallying hard, right, up to 102, I think, by like January 2017. And then yep. when everyone was dollar bullish, because the trend seemed to be established, 
I, I think I think the dollar is being managed. I think all these major five or six currencies are being managed. So if the dollar gets too high on the dollar index or against emerging market currencies, there's complaints from emerging market central banks, emerging market corporations, emerging market banks, emerging market governments, et cetera, et cetera. And so, you know, the management is that like if the if the dollar leaves the range of, say, 88 to 102, if it gets too high or too low, there's problems. Well, if you remember, I, I had done an article on that, how the Fed manages the dollar, and that's correct. And they manage it through, they buy and sell each other's currencies to keep their dollars in a range. I mean, the yuan also was the same thing. They had it pegged to a certain range in the dollar. These currencies aren't free-floating to the extent that whatever the market says happens. The central banks of the currencies themselves will use the foreign exchange to move their currency in line with where they think that acceptable range is. Now, the problem is the United States calls the shots. So if it if the dollar goes up and it hurts the 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 emerging markets too much, they view that as collateral damage, probably. But uh, they also know that a lot of these far uh, emerging market company countries have dollar denominated debt and it makes it more expensive to them and it's not in the US's best interest for emerging markets just to collapse so clearly they have to coordinate the exchange rates there's no way because otherwise you would have a currency like the dollar or the euro just skyrocket versus the others and that wouldn't be good for anybody exactly if the if the dollar gets too low too quickly or too high too quickly it's very very bad and i would say that the us does coordinate things but not with china so there's there's clearly things are escalating with China in terms of trade war and there's a lot of other stalemates with China. China's running the dollar peg. We know that President Trump and Treasury Secretary Mnuchin do not like that. But I think you're exactly right that the U.S. in terms of managing things with the European Central Bank, the Bank of England, Japan, probably at least some emerging markets does have a lot of control there. We actually know from Nomi Prinz's new book, uh, Collusion, that the Federal Reserve and other U.S. people up there, economic elites in like the IMF and the uh, Federal Reserve and the U.S. Department of Treasury put a lot of pressure on people in emerging markets at like the Central Bank of Brazil and the Brazilian government to not drastically devalue their currency and fall along with similar policies to what Ben Bernanke wanted years ago. And it's probably true that the U.S. and China before Trump coordinated um, interest rates as well. Yeah, but I, I would add though that that um, you know we're uh, we're recording this today on August 9th, 2018, because our listeners want a date on these things. The dollar index right now is at 95.61. So the, right. in my opinion, it's a strong dollar. In in quotes, it's not really in my opinion strong enough yet to do an enormous amount of damage. Now there is, according to some estimates, about 20 trillion dollars in dollar denominated emerging market debt. So that's counting emerging market governments and emerging market banks and corporations. So the stronger the dollar does get, especially with that amount of debt and leverage in dollar denominated debt, the more pain there will be. But I think the major pain point for the dollar index is if like it heads to 100 or 102, then I think there will be more intervention. And a lot of people don't know that that article that talked about how much emerging market debt is in dollar denominated, the bulk of it is in Chinese. In China, people think of the the Chinese yuan as standing in opposition to the dollar, but the Chinese economy, to a large degree, has a lot of exposure to the dollar. It's not like they have the yuan and we have the dollar, and it's a battle that way. It's yeah. they're 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 reliant not just on their treasury holdings for dollar denominated uh, assets that they have, but also because they're state owned enterprise, state owned banks, and also the People's Bank of China itself often issue dollar denominated debt a lot of a lot of uh foreign governments and foreign corporations and foreign banks they issue dollar denominated debt and that's because they weren't thinking of the long term you know the hedge fund well, managers that well if you hear the hedge fund managers talk about this they call it a dollar shortage but i think the best way to say is it's very irresponsible borrowing i don't know if it's irresponsible i think it's market driven because they know it's more stable to issue a dollar denominator. We're not going to have a devaluation in the yuan. Remember, there was a time when the United States issued bonds in the late 70s during the Carter year. They were called Carter bonds. They issued them denominated in Swiss francs. 
because the Swiss franc was deemed a more stable currency than the U.S. dollar. So I think they're smart to do it. It may hurt their national gains, but in order to get access to capital, people want to know that they're going to owe dollars and they're going to want to know it's easier if everyone understands the value of the dollar, how to pay back in a range of finances in dollars than it is in some third world currency. So I don't think that that's why they're borrowing. We, we're going to have to agree to disagree on this. I think the reason that they're borrowing in dollars is because they're actually speculating. They're gambling that the dollar, that the uh, President Trump, the Federal Reserve, Mnuchin are going to want to continue to weaken the dollar. So maybe it's those budget deficits in in the near future that are going to blow out at way over a trillion dollars. Maybe it's a quantitative tightening that starts to really hurt. The U.S. economy in the near future. The Federal Reserve's balance sheet right now, I just checked it, they've already sold off uh, $250 billion in assets since the stated peak of $4.5 trillion. So, so Well, it's possible that there, there is an element of that, but this has been going on for, for decades with emerging markets issuing dollar-denominated bonds. And, and what, what happens, Lewis, when, when they borrow too much in dollars and then the dollar has a rally? You get... Well, yeah, then they're screwed. That's right. Yes, yes. So, so they, they, uh, that's that would be my argument that that they were gambling that the dollar wouldn't strengthen. Yeah, but the the, the flip side to that is they might not otherwise be able to do any financing. So they they're not in the driver's and, seat. When and, you want to borrow money, you you have to you know. That's fair, Lewis. But the libertarian in me would say live within their means. <laughs> that's <laughs> the world is not based on living within their means. It's based on a debt based financing. Well. But I, I would say the politicians and the other corporations would have to stop being a zombie corporation. Okay. Don't well, you got to tell that. To, I mean, if you look at China, we can move there now. Uh, figuratively, not move there. <laughs> but uh, oh, oh yeah, we we we'd probably be in prison already. Our social credit scores, just for what we said in the last couple months about China, would be pretty bad already. Well. Well, yes, if they don't like if you speak against their economy, but they have so many non-performing loans. You would say, well, why did they make those loans in the first place? Well, there was a not necessarily an economic need to make the loans, but there was a governmental need to make the loans so that their state-owned enterprises could build that bridge, employ those people. And they countries do not live within their means. That's a fact. I mean, they're they're there to provide full employment, they're there to boost the economy, stimulate the economy, and if they have to borrow money to do it, they're going to do it, but once you're in the mindset you have to borrow money, it makes sense to borrow it in dollars. Well, un under gold standard, Lewis, countries had to live within their means, so you, yes. there could not be this irresponsible credit because countries could not consume yeah. more than they produce indefinitely, right? When when was the last time we had a, a gold standard? 70s, right? So no, that's not, that wasn't even a gold standard. That was a dollar standard backed by gold. We haven't had countries pegging their currencies to a unit of gold since uh, the late 19th century, early early uh, 20th century. Because the dollar standard of the Bretton Woods Agreement wasn't the same as a gold standard. It was just everyone agreed that the dollar was as good as gold and that if you were a central bank and you had dollars, you can redeem it for gold at the treasury. But it didn't stop countries from running deficits. It wasn't the same thing. That's a, that's a good point. Yeah, I mean, the original gold standard is when a lot of the profligacy of the governments with the borrowing and the spending stopped. Yes, there was the classical gold standard that would prevent that. The, the actual problem with the Bretton Woods Agreement, it didn't stop the United States. What stopped it was, was Nixon taking a unilateral <laughs> um, action to stop it and saying, oh, well, I know we have this agreement, but temporarily you can't get any more gold. But under, under that agreement, there was nothing stopping the United States from running up deficits, and there was nothing stopping foreign central banks that were signatories to come and get their gold. The only thing that was stopping them from coming to get it was Nixon saying, you can't have it anymore. So let's talk about China again. Do you think the best case scenario for China is what happened to Japan 30 or 40 years ago? Well, it's, it's an interesting question because I don't think people, and I'm not a China expert, but I'm willing to look at something other than China is destined to rule the world. And the parallel that I see is I remember the late 80s when Japan was going to take over the world. They were buying property around the world. They bought Rockefeller Center. And that Japan basically had figured out how to run a centrally controlled, top-down economy and 
the Japanese people were all on board with it. Their their companies were studied by uh, business analysts, and their banks were studied. And it was the Japanese way, the Japanese model, and it was it was superior to the restraints that a free capitalist society might have that wasn't being driven by government dictates. And now what China's done is very similar. China takes a very top-down approach to their economy, not just their economy, but their society, similar to the way Japan is as well. The difference is China is much larger. China didn't have a history behind it. I mean, China has been industrialized since before World War II. China has not been industrialized and only became industrialized. And they moved three, four, five hundred million people into cities. They set up these um, companies, state-owned companies, with the understanding and at the at the blessing of the West in order to be the manufacturing hub for Europe and the United States. And they've gone through all that and they realize that in order to keep the engine running, they have to continue to grow. And the only way they can continue to grow is to borrow more money and borrow more money to do what? Well, they have to build more projects. And if there's no more projects to build, they got to find places to build them. So they move out to the Belt and Road and they decide, well, we'll just start building projects out in, outside of our country. And then they realize that they were hitting a, a inflection point. Uh, the People's Bank of China, one of the governors said, we may have reached a Minsky moment, a moment at which the borrowing doesn't do us any good and we're pretty much hosed. And they were starting to try to deleverage their economy from debt. And then Trump hit them with tariffs. And what did they have to do? They said, oh, well, those companies are not going to do well. So they have to lend them more money. They have to give them more subsidies. And they have to give them tax breaks. And now they're talking about to keep the wheels on. They have to do more infrastructure projects, which was exactly what they were saying six months ago. They needed to slow down on that. They wanted to move from a building manufacturing society they wanted to become somewhat more of a service economy like the united states and now they're in a position where they can't because the wheels would come off and remember you've got four or five hundred million people they're basically living in cities you can't even name them i can't there's 20 30 cities in china that have millions of people in them that didn't exist 30 40 years ago so they have a their work cut out for them to try to figure out I think the only thing they can do is borrow more money and build more stuff. But we're seeing now that, for example, in, I think it's Malaysia, the country decided they don't want to do this $20 billion uh, project that's going to connect the railway between the Malay Peninsula and South China. So they're running into difficulty in exporting their model of hyper uh, real estate growth, hyper infrastructure growth. And I, I don't see how they end up doing any better than Japan has done. Now, Japan, because it was, they just hit a stagnation point for what, 25 years. You could see the same thing in China. Because if the United States and Europe don't buy as much from them, sure, they can build the stuff and eventually buy it themselves. But that's only going to replace what they lost. So that's not growth at all. Now, what would really hurt them, and I don't, I don't think this could happen, but you never know with Trump if the if the United States starts to rebuild some manufacturing capacity, then in a sense China will never get that those pieces back. I don't know if that'll happen, but the point is that China's model, any debt based model, ends up to have certain amount of um, it, it, in order to keep growing, it has to keep borrowing, and when you stop borrowing and you stop growing, you have problems. And I think the Board of Governor uh, of the People's Bank of China, the guy who said that, he may be correct. They may have already peaked. And they may have trouble, and they're not going to try to deleverage, so they're just basically kicking the can down the road with the debt. Yeah, I, th I think they're trapped. I don't think they can deleverage. The math just doesn't work. The People's Bank of China's balance sheet, the publicly stated one, it's leveraged seven to one. They claim to have around five, a little bit over five trillion dollars in assets, but they have they have over $35 trillion in liabilities. And internal credit in China 
is growing at, according to the IMF, the pace. It's over $35 trillion now, I think, last year. And, and the next couple of years, it's going to be over $40 trillion. And then in like five or six years, they're saying around 2022-ish, they're saying it could be over $50 trillion US dollars worth of credit that was created inside China. And now, a lot of that credit, even though it was created, didn't necessarily give them a return. And some of it is, a good portion of it, depending on the industry, is non-performing. Exactly. Well, well, according to one, that's funny you bring that up, Lewis, because didn't you post, you talked about this in one of your videos in the last couple of months, I saw it, that there was an interview with someone from the uh, former PBOC official, and this was, I think, the South China Morning Post, and he said, according to the people he's talked to, 80% of the Chinese banking sector has uh, non-performing loans. Yeah, and I think, and, like, real estate is 25 it depends on the industry, and this is their own internal, which no one ever trusts the the... The government figures, if they're bad, but what they were actually admitting to didn't sound very good. Yeah, I think they're only claiming about 25% or 30% non-performing loans. But, but that's horrible. That I mean, that's... Well, that's yeah, that's only that's, that's only oh, that's only European bad. That's only Italian bank bad. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's not good at all. Yeah, but I... For, and this is directly from someone inside China who is well-connected, and he says it's 80%, but I guess it's a good thing then that China owns... 90% uh, of their banks are owned by the government because <laughs> they can just technically they could almost do a debt jubilee, right? Except for the dollar denominated state owned enterprise debt. Yes, but the, the what they've done, and there's two problems with that. The first problem is, yeah, they can do that. They can not only uh, recapitalize their banks and they can lower capital requirements of banks, they can instruct their banks, as they often do, to extend the terms of the loans to the state-owned enterprises that are not making money, they can say to the bank, convert those those loans into equity, so now you don't have a debt on your balance sheet. They can do any number of tricks. But the problem with doing that is you are debasing your currency. And if you ever want to have an international currency, these people, oh, the Chinese yuan is going to be a world reserve currency. It's going to be 100% gold backed, Lewis. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just, I, I don't You're really kidding. believe that. I just, I just. No, what I'm saying is the rest of the world sees this and they don't just say, oh, they're just playing games with themselves. It's not really a problem. Of course it is. You can't have any confidence in an economy that lends money. It all goes, 40, 50% of it goes bust and they just lend them some more money and say, not a problem. And they have to keep, and it's not even in China's interest to have a reserve currency and to have some type of, see, the reason the Fed never went to negative interest rates was, it probably would have lost that status. But if you want to devalue your currency whenever you feel like it because you need to to meet some government mandate because you have to employ people and you have to produce more uh, widgets, you can't do that if, if people are expecting. That's why people don't issue yuan-denominated notes. No one knows what they're going to have to pay back in yuan. So I think that China is in a in a tough spot. A lot of people think they're not. They think, well, they have gold. But, you know, I've done the numbers on that. And I even given that they may have more gold than the People's Bank of China says, and clearly they do. The People's Bank of China claims 1,843 tons of gold on the balance sheet. Now, we know that they've imported about 6,000 tons through Hong Kong the past whatever. We know they've they've mined more than that, four or 5,000 tons. Let me just get the exact numbers. But the point is, is that... Um, the amount of gold in China and with other state-owned enterprises, clearly more than 1,843 tons and close to 20,000 tons. However, um, 20,000 tons is worth less than a trillion dollars at today's prices. And even if you go up four times, you could do the numbers. It still doesn't come close to covering the utter amount of just bad debt that they have, notwithstanding the regular debt that they have, and they have trillions. So the amount of gold that they have, even if you say they have 20,000 tons, I think I did a calculation, even at $10,000 an ounce, which would be quite a stretch to get to, um, you're looking at about $5.5 trillion worth of gold. And plus, Lewis, if, if you're running a gold standard 100% gold back, you risk all the gold leaving the country. Look what happened in the U.S. And that's exactly right. And that's why that so whole I don't think China wants that. I don't no, think China of course wants not. that. The, uh, the other thing is I would bring up about China's gold mining is they are number one in gold mining, but that's because they're running it at a loss. They are mining gold that is not economic. Most people don't talk about this. And, and it not, doesn't leave and it doesn't leave the country either. Correct. 
Correct. They are mining gold. They are, they, the Chinese government is subsidizing enormous amounts of gold production. They are carrying, pulling the gold forward. China does not have, if you talk to geologists, massive... The reserves are not. That's right. They yes. have the number one gold production, but they don't have the largest reserves. The exactly. number I have here, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> from the USGS, I think it is, mining production from 2000 to 2016 is about 5,200 tons. That's world leading. And in Hong Kong imports according to the numbers I get them, I think from Nick Laird has them, they're about 9,100 tons over the last 16, 17 years. So you add that up with the People's Bank of China, you add in some imports that you don't know about through Shanghai or other ports, and you get to your 20,000 tons. But at current prices, it's like $750 billion. It's a few months worth of QE. It's not, and people say, oh, they got so much gold. They don't realize that gold, the amount of gold that exists in physical form at the central banks is not a large nominal amount in terms of the whole uh, the balance sheet sizes of these banks so i would make a distinction in about china and i'm not sure if a lot of people are making this distinction but based on the people i've talked to some mainland chinese people i met at conferences i met a crypto person who was from mainland china he marched at tiananmen he had some very interesting stories to tell me he doesn't want to come on a podcast so because he's worried about repercussions with the chinese government if he ever sure. comes back if he ever goes back to China, but he did tell me some off the rec- record anecdotal stories. And you know, the, the private sector Chinese technology companies, those immense ones like Alibaba and Baidu, they're, they're in great shape. They're in great shape. The problem in China, Lewis, is oh, the central planning. The Keynesian central planning, it's on a massive scale. It's massive, it's, you know, the, the Americans back then for FDR's uh, ditch dig- digging programs, the people complained about that. Well, China's insanely bigger. So they have a credit bubble. And I think in the near future that they are going to do probably – They it, since April, we've already had basically a 10% devaluation of the RMB against the dollar. But I think you know probably in less than five years, there might even be a much, much larger devaluation. And if people say you're crazy, Jason, you don't know what you're talking about, I'll just, I'll just talk about financial history with China. Most people aren't aware that 20 years ago, Lewis, that China did – without warning, by the way, they did a, a – like yes. – they did a 50, 50 year, yeah. They did a massive devaluation over. Yep. Yeah, and they need, and they, and they'll do that if they have to do it, and that's why they can't be a reserve currency. Exactly, but that keeps the Chinese government in power, right? So, so you know, it's they're they're not gonna maybe if they decided in the future a long time from now that they're not gonna do those devaluations anymore and people trusted them maybe they could get the world reserve currency but until they say that they're gonna stop you know those crazy devaluations then I don't think people are gonna trust them enough for them to get the world reserve currency at least not a, it's not just it's not just a function of them uh, doing devaluations it's a function of the amount of internal debt now a lot of people say Jason but you see China produces stuff. And all that infrastructure is going to be valuable, whereas uh, the United States <clears throat> just has a lot of debt. Now, the problem with that analysis is if you have a financial collapse and you have built infrastructure that you weren't using during the boom time, that infrastructure is certainly not going to be used in a collapse. And in fact, in fact, infrastructure, when you build it, people don't understand, I don't know how they don't get this, is when you build an infrastructure project, you're expecting to get a return on the infrastructure because people are using it. And therefore, the bank that lent the money to the state-owned enterprise to build the infrastructure is not going to get paid back because it's not being used now. It's certainly not going to be used in a financial crisis. And in order for that to be considered an asset, infrastructure that no one's using and buildings that no one's using, you have to maintain them, and there but, has to be ca- there has to be ca- some type of cash flow from it to just pay back the maintenance contracts, right, like you said, right. for to maintain them. So, so it's, it's actually kind of, worse it's, that they're it's, actually it's, borrowing money to build things that they don't need, and people yeah. are cheering them on and say, "Oh, look, they're how it's, productive it's they a, are." It's a more sophisticated Keynesian ditch digging program. Correct. So instead Correct. of just you know the old uh, free market Austrian school analogy was Keynes was telling people to okay this guy will dig a ditch and then this guy will fill it back up you know rinse repeat right make, but make what China has fun. done is they've gone okay we're going to build all these bridges they're building bridges in economies you know with one belt and one road I think they're going to lose almost all that money that one trillion dollars that's just to keep a bunch of civil unrest uh, from a, a bunch of you know adult male Chinese who normally might not have been able to get a job because the factory jobs, the wages are rising too much, and a lot of them are automating. Yeah, well, look what happened. As we mentioned, that Malaysian deal went through. 
Now they were counting on that deal to work, and that deal's not going to work. Well, you, so, you said it, you said it went through. You meant it, it went busk. Well, 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 they, well they, the, what they did was they put it on hold. The Malaysians put it on hold. Now the yeah, question is, <laughs> did did the Malaysian government put it on hold, or did the Chinese government back out of it? You never know. And the, the argument I could make that they might have backed out of the deal was they knew they weren't going to make any money on it, so they didn't want to keep doing it. Who knows what happened there? But the idea that China is just going to inexorably roll across the the Asian continent into Europe and end dollar hegemony and control the world, it's somewhat ludicrous to think that way. But but many in the gold community actually believe that because they're conditioned to think China is their gold buddy and China has gold and therefore everything they do has to be good because they're smart. They like gold. I, I, I think when you start with a premise that something that someone or some entity that likes gold therefore is smart and they're like you and therefore they've got everything figured out and that people who don't have gold and don't like gold are either are stupid and don't know what's going on i hear that all the time oh americans are stupid they don't understand gold that doesn't mean they're stupid it means they don't understand gold there's a lot of things that people who like gold don't understand that doesn't make them stupid either so i don't know i i get i get frustrated when i hear they use gold as a sign of intelligence, and it's not. It's a sign sometimes, like Turkey has a lot of gold. Is that a, an economy or a society you want to emulate? Um, all the central banks that are adding gold, like Kazakhstan, they have a horrible currency. It's not like Kazakhstan knows what's going on, and the rest of the world is just a bunch of morons. Well, that's how they make it sound, that the countries that are buying gold are smart, and those that aren't are stupid. And then you look at the countries that are buying it, and you're like, how is it? How are they better off? And you've also said, Lewis, and I agree with this too, that if things do get worse in China, there is some type of credit bust. The government does do a massive devaluation. I don't know if 10% is enough yet because I think you can correct me if I'm wrong about this, that the gold price in RMB hasn't really done much lately. It's, I think it's been going down. But at some point, if things do get worse in China, a financial crisis in China or some type of bank bailout or bank holiday or devaluation or something along those lines, that that would actually probably be bullish for gold then. Gold demand would rise. Uh, Bitcoin or crypto Currency demand could probably start to spike again as well. Yeah, there's, you know, you can, everyone can speculate as to why one asset will go up or not. But the gold people have it in their minds that gold is going to go higher because there's going to be some type of reset. And quote, the smart countries that are accumulating gold, they're going to be running the world. I, I don't that gold doesn't run the world. It's not like if you have, you know, they say he who has the gold makes the rules. That, that's not true anymore. I don't see people don't even I'm not downplaying the value of gold, but I think that gold has been overplayed in many people's minds about even in China, that somehow gold is going to save China and that also having gold makes them smarter than everybody. That doesn't make any sense. I also think you've you've correctly questioned the narrative that like, you know, China, in order for the gold price to go higher, China has to prosper. The U.S. has to collapse. No. There's problems. I think we've outlined in this in this talk here. We didn't talk about European banks that much. We didn't talk about some of the other credit bubbles or the long term pension fund crisis globally. We didn't talk about I mean, we could spend hours talking about all these different things. I, I call them financial or economic landmines. There's so many of them. So, you know, it, it only takes a couple of these things to go bad. China, there's in the gold community. The narrative is that China is doing great right. and that they're accumulating gold. But you know what? If things and, and, and and that the U.S. is just a debt monster, and that somehow because China has gold, it's sound money. They have worse debt situation than the United States. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I think the Chinese government is so desperate to maintain power, and we're seeing this now with the totalitarian stuff that they're trying to do with the technology spying and the social contract, and the, excuse me, and the social the social credit score and all that ridiculous stuff. They're and banning of Winnie but, the Pooh. But, <laughs> and banning of Winnie the Pooh because they said he looks like the Chinese premier and they won't allow Winnie He's the Pooh no to be He's no longer premier. He is now Emperor Xi. Okay. <laughs> Winnie the Pooh. There's no more elections, right? Didn't he ban those or something? I think he said – no, I think – yeah, he's president for life. That's right. Yes, yes. Yeah. Now, I don't understand how if you're for free markets, free economy, and you think that gold is part of that, that somehow you take the gold part out of the free markets, the free economy, you put it into China – and that, and then you like wave a magic wand, and now China is some type of free market, free economy, uh, no censorship, no social credit scores. It doesn't make any sense to me. The China worship. And if things get bad, 
this I'm going to say this publicly for the first time, and I don't think a lot of people are want to hear, and people are going to probably say really nasty comments. But if things get bad enough in China for the Chinese government, for the Chinese government to protect themselves, to save themselves, they would be willing to sell some gold for dollars to save themselves, to yeah. buy time. Well, they could, but again, as we mentioned, they really don't have that much in nominal dollar terms, even if they can round up the 20,000 tons of gold that are scattered in the different uh, banks and, and entities and sovereign wealth funds. That's only going to buy a few months of time. Because remember, if they're going to sell it, the price isn't going to be going up when they're selling it. And right now, 20,000 tons of gold is worth less than $800 billion. So they're not going to get much for it. Exactly. Well, people but, think they but, just have but, gold. Not, and it's, it's I, crazy. I don't hate. So I don't hate China. I'm just pointing out that there's right. problems. In China I don't either. I, I, the thing is, exactly. I think people think I bash. I'm not bashing China. I'm not bashing the Chinese people. I am saying that they're in a position and it's through their own making. It is a function of how they structured their economy. And a lot of people think that China was contra to the United States. China's only in the position they're in because they agreed to and went along with the dictates of the West to become the manufacturing hub. Yep, and that United, financing. remember that, remember that, that statement, we think and they sweat. I mean, that's offensive, but that's what the, the mentality was behind Apple creating in, in their air conditioned Silicon Valley offices, all these cool designs and then shipping it out to China. But they agreed yes. to that and they agreed to a centrally planned economy and it benefited them really. And it would be continuing except this Trump thing is really a is, is throwing a bombshell in the middle of a of an economic order that had been going on for 15, 20 years. Not that China wouldn't have been eventually hitting a wall, but this is accelerated the problem. They weren't prepared for this. Exactly. I think I think China has a lot of problems ever has all the major economies, whether that's the European Union, the United States, Japan, China, they all have a lot of problems. So there's credit bubbles all over the globe. And we're going to I mean, uh, Daniel Martino Booth did an interview in the last couple months. She used to work at the Dallas Federal Reserve, and she said people at the Federal Reserve are even discussing now, not immediately, but in the future, years from now, potential debt jubilee, some type of reset. I, you know, I agree with that, because when when do you. When is too much debt too much? We just have to say, maybe the United States tells China, look, you've been ripping us off for years. We figure you owe us $1.3 trillion. Give up your treasury bills. We're not going to pay on them. Now, who knows? Yeah, I mean, anecdotally, though, in China, there's so for the people who are always bullish China, there's just so much evidence beneath the surface that a lot of things are getting worse. I mean, look at the public disagreement recently between someone in the People's Bank of China and China's Treasury Ministry. Normally, the Chinese government would never handle those things in public. It would always be behind closed doors. So that's a red flag to me that things are a lot worse than public. The Chinese government is publicly willing to admit normally. You know why? You know why that's a red flag? Because they're thinking about if there is a problem and there's an aftermath they want to be able to rally whatever side they may have. I mean it's just like in any country you can have a civil war I mean you can have factions everything is fine while the, while the strong man's in charge but when the strong man goes and the central planning doesn't work as planned you have chaos and people want to put their markers down if they think that's a possibility and I would add to Lewis that I hope I'm wrong about this, but I think the U.S. is unfortunately headed towards an ideological civil war because, you know, there's just there's there's not even polite uh, discussion or debate now. It's just like really nasty ad hominem attacks to people. They don't even I mean, people people in general now on are on one or two sides. There's very few people in the middle. Things are getting more and more radical, more and more polarizing. And we're starting to see examples in the news all over the United States of violence. So we're not at the levels of, you know, a, a full violent, uh, a full violent ideological civil war yet. But, you know, things, I hope I'm wrong about this. If things continue this way, we're headed there. But a couple more stories about China that our listeners should pay attention to. Lewis, I don't know if you've heard some of the anecdotal stories for years about money leaving China, but I was having dinner. I had my uh, Wall Street from Main Street celebratory party at the end of June for 20,000 YouTube channel subscribers. Unfortunately, I'm probably not going to get many more because they're censoring the crap out of this channel, making sure it doesn't grow, making sure I don't make any, uh, can't make a living off of it. But anyway, at that party, one of my friends who was there, 
he told me the story uh one of his family members lives in canada and i think up around montreal area and he said that there was chinese buyers recently the last couple of years coming in there like crazy with briefcases of cash willing to pay fifty thousand dollars or more over the price for for uh real- oh sure and they're in effect doing money laundering they're, they're taking money out because there's capital controls that's why bitcoin had to be shut down in china because a lot of money was leaving china via bitcoin but but there's been there's been this has been going on for over a decade now with all China's all that credit bubble and central planning. There's been enormous corruption in China from government government officials and state owned enterprise officials and even even uh, private sector Chinese with government contracts. They've stolen a lot of money and a lot of that money has left China and it's gone into you know real estate. Initially it went into like premier real estate in Toronto and Vancouver and London yep. and and coastal cities in the United States, but now it's going in Australia, and now it's going all over in other areas you might not expect. It's going into also general U.S. stocks. There's been a lot of flight capital that's come in from Europe and China into the U.S., the general stock markets as well. And when you when it, And capital flight is a real problem, and you can see why a country wants to ban it, but it's also a sign of an economy that doesn't have good investments in its own country. If you think about it, all that bad debt means... Why would you invest in a Chinese project if it doesn't have a chance, if it, if it looks like it's going to join the the ranks of non-performing loans? So you'd rather and, invest outside of China. And Louis, isn't, isn't, correct me if I'm wrong about this, isn't 50% of China's GDP now already on speculative real estate projects? I think it's shifted over the last like 10 or 15 years. I, I now, don't they, know that number, but I also know a lot of people say that the Chinese consumer – is a saver. That's no longer true. I saw something, and I think it was Bloomberg the other day. They speculate in all kinds of stuff in real estate. A lot of the individual citizens of China have speculative real estate investments all over the place, and a lot of other. They're not saving the way they used to either. So one thing about Japan during this entire period of stagnation, the Chinese were coherent in their savings rate. And so Japan or Chinese? Japan, I'm sorry. Japan, because we were comparing China to Japan, China's lost that. China doesn't have that saving internal savings rate the way Japan had for the for the 25 years. That's always been an underpinning. If you think about it, the the Japanese yen is still considered a safe haven currency. I have no idea why. With the profit well, is used for carry trades. I know, but trades, yeah. but still, it's it's like it, it's not you a know, sound currency because of the, uh, the size of the balance sheet, the negative interest rates, the no growth in, in Japan. But one of the things that does help them is they do have that internal savings rate. There, Japan is definitely, we didn't have a lot of time to discuss Japan on the podcast today. There's a lot of interesting things going on in Japan. You have the Japanese Central Bank, which owns an enormous amount of stock market ETFs. They owe, they basically are the Japanese government bond market. Right. Days, I, I don't even think there's any trading volume and a lot of these Japanese pension funds are drastically underfunded. And yet we have the government statistics in Japan that say there's been massive deflation for all this time. But almost all the some of the most expensive cities in the world are in Japan. So and if you talk with our listeners on the podcast, they've sent me photos from Twitter. You know, the food prices in Japan, you get you get less for more money every single year. Basically, there's pictures proving this of like. Beer cans changing size, prices either not going, uh, either staying flat, and you get less portion for the same price, or the price goes up and you still get less portion. So, and obviously that's not counted in the inflation statistics. So this is this is a pervasive problem, inaccuracy in inflation statistics in the U.S., Japan, etc. Yeah, and it's interesting that Japan, even though it had this, it, it never got to the levels of what China's been doing. And it's think about it, Japan has a currency that many central banks hold as a reserve. It's considered a safe haven. I don't agree with it, but that's the market. They do not do the same with the Chinese yuan. But but, but Japan was making mostly cars and some other electronics and, and some consumer products. They were not making all the everyday manufacturing stuff that people were buying at Walmart. So I don't think Japanese manufacturing was taking up quite the amount of like everyday things. You're, you're not old enough to remember, but made in japan in the 70s was considered making all that cheap trinket stuff they moved well, I, I, they moved I up the value line to cars but made in japan i, mean, I think there was a deep purple album from 1972 called that and it was kind of a takeoff they they made the album in japan 
but it was a takeoff when people were thinking that Japan was a place where they made cheap goods. That's not the reputation that, that Japan has now. And, and to China's credit, that's no longer the – there's some a lingering uh, concept that China makes cheap stuff, but they've also moved up the value chain. They make white goods. They make refrigerators. I, I agree. I've researched this. I wasn't born then in the 70s. I was born in the early 80s. But, you know, Toyota Toyota was actually running for decades at a loss. So they were subsidized by the Japanese government mm-hmm. for a very long time, making really crappy pickup trucks and, you know, really tiny little cars that they either, either lost money on or barely broke even on. And eventually, as they got more and more market share here in the U.S., they improved quality control. They automated. You know, they did these things. And then now look at Toyota now. But, you know. If well, look at Lexus. Was- Lexus is you never had considered. Back then, I remember that. You had a Toyota hatchback. They were cheap cars. They were horrible cars. But they were cheap from Japan. So even when they moved into cars, they were cheap. But, but now China, China, Japan has luxury cars. But the, exactly. But the government was backing that. So this wasn't full free market capitalism because they were running at a loss for a long time. So it was basically Toyota and the other some of the other corporations were state owned enterprises until they could sustain themselves. Right. Now, we don't see China getting anywhere near that. They're still subsidizing. And this tariff thing is going to make them have to subsidize even more. So so you think then that China will continue to devalue with this trade war? And do you think there can actually be a winner in the trade war? Or do you think no matter what that President Trump is going to claim a victory? Oh, you can have a winner in a trade war where uh, Trump's point, as I understand it, and I, I somewhat agree with it, is that I don't think he wants to use, he doesn't want to have tariffs. He's using the tariffs to try to create a new set of tariffs that are more advantageous because if China has doesn't have tariffs to send goods to the United States or they're at low levels. And for the United States to send goods to to China has high tariffs. He's basically putting the tariffs on Chinese goods in order for them to lower them. Now, so far, it hasn't had. What China has done is said, okay, well, we're getting soybeans from you and we're getting uh, oil and natural gas from you. Well, we're going to put a tariff on that. So it hasn't worked yet. But the idea is that if China has to blink because they're spending too much, borrowing too much to subsidize the losses that they have, and they can't necessarily replace the soybeans and the oil and the natural gas uh, at a good price, then they'd have to blink. Now, there's no guarantee that either of them blink, and if we are stuck with both sides having tariffs on the goods, then no one wins that because because before – China didn't have to pay 25% extra for oil, gas, and soybeans, and now they do. And the United States didn't have to pay an extra 25% on all the goods that were coming in from China. So that's not a winner. But the idea is is that China would blink first. Now, if China blinks first and the two sides come to an agreement, then you'll see a more normalization of tariffs on both sides. That's how I see it ending up. That would just be rational. But as some people have pointed out, China's talking about saving face as a nation. You know, you never know what these things. Yeah, I, they can get I think, they can get I out think, of hand. Well, the re- the rhetoric has escalated for months and months, but the actual behaviors it hasn't. They haven't Im- implemented a lot of the stuff that they've threatened yet. But I think you know, if I look back through financial history, I think we're gonna we're gonna see like there's gonna be some. Unfortunately, it looks like American farmers, especially for pork and soybeans, are gonna be really hard hit. Trump's going to give them subsidy, but that's not the, uh, you know, obviously with if, without him doing the tariff seed, they wouldn't even need the subsidy. So I, I, two but, wrongs don't make a right, in my opinion, from an economics perspective. But, but, but you see, remember what he's doing there in that one limit in, in instance is what China does across all of its economy. Yeah. <laughs> so so that's where the well, issue is. They're, they're subsidizing yeah, I mean, everything. As, as, an Austrian, as an Austrian school economist, someone who hates government intervention, you know, I, I see the U.S. getting into more government intervention. I just see – Clearly, my, clearly. In order to yeah, combat yeah. – see, but it's, they're combating the Chinese government intervention. I, I see a lot. I see a lot. Unfortunately, I see collateral damage coming on both sides. I think the Chinese citizens are going to be worse off because the RMB is probably going to be devalued. Clearly. And the Chinese citizens who can't get their money out of the country or buy gold or silver or buy crypto or get, um, you know, uh, real estate or dollars or something, uh, and they're stuck holding those RMBs, they're going to be in trouble. And I see people, certain selected uh, business owners in the U.S. getting hurt as well. And then ultimately, Louis. Excuse me, there was a TV. There was a TV manufacturer announced today they, in the United States that they were cl- shutting down as a result of this. Wow. And then ultimately, Louis, I see worse and worse stagflation. 
And, um, you know, you're not hearing a lot of people talk about this yet, but as more and more tariffs go through the supply chain, actually you are hearing some companies on conference calls, but they're not blaming the tariffs per se. They're just saying their costs are rising and that they're trying to pass it on to their customers. Well, the steel tariff, you know, that raises the cost of finished goods that people that use steel in the United States. Yeah, and I think one of the reasons that Trump was tweeting so much about oil and gasoline prices being too high and calling out the Saudis and OPEC is he is worried about that higher oil price than it's than uh, the rally that the oil prices had since summer of 2017, because his voter base, a lot of them are you know hardworking Americans, blue collar folks, although some white collar folks um, with small business owners. But, you know, a lot of them don't have a ton of discretionary income. So if the gasoline price goes up too much, you know, it's going to really hurt them a lot more. Right. And he realizes that some of the policies he's doing will cause stagflation. So he's trying to counter that by putting more oil supply on the market to knock the oil price back down. So to help him maybe prevent the Democrats from winning the midterms and help him get reelection in 2020, if if he does want to get reelected still. <laughs> yeah, well, the thing about what what's instructive is that he was able to tell Saudi Arabia to produce more oil, which goes against the concept that the petrodollar is dying because they went ahead and they said, sure, go, we'll, we'll do that. And by the way, the United States is now also a major oil provider. So if you need underpinning for the petrodollar, you've got people having to have dollars to buy oil from Saudi Arabia, but they also have to have dollars to buy oil from the new big oil producer in the world, the United States. And thanks to cheap credit that's been artificially subsidized, I mean, a lot of these shale and that's right. pension funds in desperate need of any type of returns that have stupidly bought junk bonds from some of these shale oil producers, you know, a lot of the shale oil production never generated any free cash flow for years. Some of it in the last 12 months or so is starting to generate some free cash flow now, but it's been some of it's been producing Lewis, since 2008 with no free cash flow, barely. So, barely so, so think what that's like. That's the free market putting money into stuff that doesn't, but still manages well, to produce. So, so, so I don't, I don't know if that's the free market, but those are people trying to make a buck in the private sector that are that are reacting to what the central banks and the banking system sure. have done. Sure, it's influenced. Manipulating interest rates. It's, yeah. it's influenced by, but my point is, it's similar to, analogous to, what China's doing in order to get its productive numbers up. So, 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 do you, do, so do you think a good question then first is like who who would collapse first, the U.S. or China? Because I mean they're both. I think the I think it's pretty clear that both countries are doing bad things right now. I mean, what I would say from an economic standpoint is bad things. Yes, they are, and and they and what might happen as a result of doing more bad things is they may get to a point where they both do better things. But right now, it, they're going in the other direction. But the idea is that if both countries realize this isn't going to work, putting on increasingly higher tariffs on an increasingly larger number of goods at increasingly nominal values, that's not going to work. Maybe they, in their own self-interest, to say enough. If they don't say enough, then it's a horrible thing because everyone just has more tariffs. But I actually think at some point, I don't think that either country will drive itself to collapse, but you never know. But if they don't drive themselves to collapse, but they drive them each other to pain, they should come to the table and make better arrangements for lower tariffs on both sides. And it'll be interesting to see how China handles the problems from HNA, from Anbang, and the new one I heard was Henang Asset Management, mm. where they've been stuffing bad assets for, for I think, 15 or 20 years. <laughs> I, th I think under the hood, China has more problems than the U.S. does. I wouldn't disagree with that. I wouldn't disagree with that. The U.S. for now, the market is, is giving the U.S. the benefit of the doubt with the world reserve currency. But we know if the dollar index gets too the dollar gets too strong against other currencies in the dollar index and emerging markets, that President Trump and Mnuchin don't want a strong dollar. They also don't want the dollar to fall too quickly. So, like we said, it's being managed. And if the dollar index does rise too quickly, they will figure out a way to get it down. Yeah, and that's why you're probably going to see. I don't know. The counting. I think the the bets are two interest rates this year with the first one at the next meeting at very high probability. But that might be it. You know, they may get to two and a half, two and a quarter, and that would drive the price higher. But remember what they can do as the interest rates are rising, they can start talking about, uh, they can start jawboning that the rate cycle is coming to an end and that at some point they are going to start 
stopping to raise rates. You see how that works? So even they can get away with another one or two as long as they're talking about not raising them anymore. That's how they drove the dollar index up without actually raising rates in the first place. They kept jawboning how they were going to raise rates, they were going to raise rates, and they never did it. And they finally did it at the end of 2015. And then all through 2016, they talked about doing it and they never did it. But they got the benefit as if they had done it and then they finally did raise it. So they can do the reverse on the flip side when they want that the dollar's getting too strong. They can talk about not raising rates anymore, even though they may have just raised one and they may raise another, they may raise at the next meeting. So they give forward guidance is the word. They can jawbone that they're not going to raise rates much longer. And, and on a relative basis, Lewis, the U.S. technically, and this is their publicly stated balance sheet. So we all, uh, everyone who listens to my channel knows about the currency swaps and the problems in Europe with the European banks. How basically, I think one of the main reasons that Europe did start the QE was because they were co they have been covertly bailing out the banks for a while now, trying to delay any any crash or collapse or bankrupt uh, run on a bank like a daisy chain, a contagion. But I, I think ultimately, well. Let's just wrap. Let's just work on wrapping up the interview here, because we we've gone for for an hour now. So closing thoughts, Lewis, maybe then on the gold market as it is right now. So gold prices. You you sent me some charts not too long ago, that almost all the gold analysts, Lewis, they say they say if gold isn't doing well in dollars, gold is doing well in other currencies. You pointed out that that's basically not true. Uh, which currencies is gold doing well in then? <laughs> Well, let me pull it up here. I mean, gold isn't really doing well. Well, gold is doing well in currencies that are doing very, very poorly. So if you look at, um, for example, Turkey, Turkey's, uh, the price of gold, let me pull it up here. The price of gold in Turkish lira has gone from, it's right here in front of me, here it is. In January of 2018, it was about 4,900 lira. You could buy an ounce of gold. In January of 2017, it was 4,000. Today, it costs 64, 6,500 lira. Now, buying gold, the Central Bank of Turkey adding gold hasn't stopped this at all. The re people think that when you buy gold, it strengthens your currency. It doesn't. It strengthens your balance sheet, but that has no impact, it seems, on the currency because if you look at the Kazakhstan Tenge, same issue. The Kazakhstan now has 43% of its reserves in gold. They've added gold 69 straight months. They've got like uh, more gold than the United Kingdom has. They have almost as much gold as the Saudi Arabians have. And their currency, the gold price, has doubled there as well. Same with the Russian ruble. Russia has been adding gold at the highest pace of any central bank. And at the beginning of the year, gold versus um the Russian ruble was 74,000, went all the way up to 85,000, and now it's at about 79,000. So gold is rising against emerging market countries, irrespective of whether they have gold on their balance sheet or buying gold hand over fist because they know what's coming. It's not. Those are the countries where gold is doing very well. Gold has done very well against the Brazilian real, another emerging market country. Started the year at about 4,000 real, went all the way up to 5,100. It's at 4,500. So you're making money, so to speak, in gold if you're an emerging market country. Argentine peso started the year at 22,000 per ounce. Now it's at 34,000. So in those types of currencies. And Venezuela. Venezuela. I, any, if you have like a mug in Venezuela. <laughs> you're doing better than anywhere else. But everywhere else, United States dollar, gold is down. Uh, Japanese yen, gold started the year at 149,000. It's now down to 134,000. Uh, British pounds, the euro, it's down. So your major market currency, Swiss francs, gold is down. Gold is only up in the emerging market uh, currencies. It's down in uh, Canadian dollars. It's basically Brazil. Turkey, Russia, Kazakhstan, Venezuela, Argentina, those are the countries where gold is doing well. And as it should, people have to remember that they say gold is insurance against currency devaluation. And everyone likes to bang on about how the United States is devaluing its currency. All true. But again, as you pointed out at the beginning of this talk, it's all relative. Yes. So they're not devaluing. So the dollar has lost 
90, more than 97% of his purchasing power since the Federal Reserve was created, but the devaluations for the U.S. now are slow each year compared to the devaluations of those emerging market currencies. And the market is weighing and discounting these things, and the people in the gold community are not necessarily either they're aware of this and intentionally misleading some people, or they're not aware of this at all. I think they're just on autopilot. End of dollar hegemony, dollar collapse. I mean, they, they just have that in their heads, and they're not looking at the rest of the rest of the data. The the other thing I would like to point out, and I'm friends with a lot of these guys, is they keep repeating like verbatim all the time. They've been doing this for year, for right. literally for the last three or four years. It's a narrative. Gold is in a stealth bull market. It's okay. A so gold, since 2015, gold had a bear market rally. It was a strong bear market rally. Correct. Okay. And maybe since then, gold was maybe in a trading range. It was going sideways. It was going sideways. It was, there's an argument to be made that gold was neither bull nor bear for a while. But, you know, I think if you talk to the mining companies, they would tell you, like the CEOs, at least the ones paying the most attention to primary gold and silver miners, that gold and silver have been in a bear market since 2011. At least the mining industry has. And, you know, they're barely getting by. And the people who are benefiting the most from all of this is the, the lar five largest royalty and streaming companies. The deals that they are getting now, whether they're doing that Sandstorm Gold, to, I, I, you, everyone knows I love Sandstorm Gold. It's not investment advice. Just, just saying that I think their business model is amazing. They have a lot of growth. They just bought another royalty, Lewis, for $10. <laughs> what can you get of value for $10? A large land package. Maybe it's not going to get drilled this year, next year. But if the gold price rallies, that thing gets drilled, that $10 royalty that you bought for buying, t buying a small amount in a private placement, that thing could throw off $2 million a year in cash flow many years from now if if the drill holes pr uh, prove that there's actually a mine there. Yeah, so these these are creative financing that otherwise you wouldn't have any, any of these deals being done, which would actually, in a way, doing these types of deals actually keeps the price lower because it ensures that some gold or silver will get mined, even if it's mined and it benefits the streamer, but otherwise, not but for the streamers, these well, temp these I, miners, I hold on, these miners could not borrow money because no one would lend it to them, and then there'd be less production, and that might help the price. I, I agree with some of what you said. You know, I think temporarily it does keep more supply online, but long term, I think it's better for there to be an alternative of financing for gold and silver miners than just the bank. It was it wasn't a, it wasn't a value judgment. It was just saying oh. that. So, but what I'm saying is, is that if it wasn't there, if that financing wasn't there, the silver mines and the gold mines would not well, get the traditional financing and there'd be less supply, which might help the supply demand, demand dynamic by curtailing some of the supply. I, I, there, there is reduced supply in the long term because a lot of the potential new mines, there's just not many, but a lot of the mines that that I personally thought would eventually go bankrupt. The last few years, the mining companies, we have to give them credit. They've they figured out ways, scraped and clawed and cut, cut corners, did everything they could to not go bankrupt and to cut every single cost possible, slashed it to the bone and keep these mines from going bankrupt. Well, and, and, and some of them though have gotten additional financing and some of them have gotten it from the streamers. Yes, that that is correct, but not some of them, like you said. But uh, we have to give the miners credit for figuring out ways to, to for the shareholders to not go fully bankrupt. Although in the long term, that might have been better for the overall sake of the market. But I, that I also kept gonna... that also kept supply in the market too, when maybe they should have shut down. But but my other theory though for why there's been a lot more silver supply than there should was because copper price was being used to keep a lot of extra silver byproduct on the market. It might be over 200 million ounces a year Makes of sense. silver byproduct that's been on the market because the copper price was much higher. But from what I'm hearing now, Lewis, with the copper price, the copper price had a like a bull market for four years or so. But the, this past year in 2018, it's had a big correction, and the copper miners are panicking. So this may, if, if a good amount of these base metal and copper mines do come offline, some of them go bankrupt, the mine shut down, that would help the silver silver price and with a, a silver byproduct coming offline. Right. Well, uh, Lewis, as we close things up, any more any thoughts on the crypto markets here that we've we've had the rally? Do you, do you think this is because maybe of RMB devaluation no. because of crypto, or do you think it's some other reason? No, they say it's because of this ETF. They you keep getting shut down on the ETFs, and 
I think that eventually you'll get an ETF. And I, I mentioned the other day that backed uh, entity, which is, I think it's a joint venture. I don't know. It's a collaborative effort between the New York Stock Exchange, Microsoft, and Starbucks. And the idea there is to have some type of regulated exchange and to help people buy and sell cryptos, to store cryptos. And the reason that the SEC has denied, I know the Winklevoss twins, um, ETF was because they did not have the type of surveillance sharing agreements where they can check in on these markets. They didn't feel comfortable that the underlying asset wasn't being manipulated. And they said at some point, we believe that the markets probably will be big enough and we will be able to have the proper insight. And my guess is, is that when you get a U.S. entity like a Coinbase or a Polynex or this backed entity registered with the SEC, the SEC will feel more comfortable with the ability to track and trace what's going on in these markets to see if there's irregularities in the markets, to see if there's manipulation, then they'll feel comfortable granting an ETF. Um, but I still, the price action doesn't make any sense because they're saying that people had priced in an ETF, but it, it's like if the ATF is going to happen and that's going to be a big deal, doesn't look like there's anything stopping it other than they're waiting for the markets to get large enough and for them to have insight into the markets. And it looks like there's enough on the horizon where there's companies that are trying to get registered with the SEC. And if that happens, you're going to have all manner of uh, look at the gold ETFs. There's, it's not just GLD. There's tons of them. There's tons of silver ETFs. I don't know. I have no idea what drives the, the crypto markets. Um, the crypto markets went up in the end of last year because they, I think it was because they were talking about the futures. Now, the thing is that the, when the, once the futures came out, it went straight down. So who knows? Maybe you'll get an ETF and then the price will go down. Maybe you get an ETF and the price will go up. I, it, there's no rhyme or reason to cryptos. There's no earnings. There's, there's You can't really value them in the same way you can predict maybe some stocks. Or even stocks are hard to do today. Yeah, and I'm not really sure how naked shorting could be done with a Bitcoin ETF. But, Lewis, I just want to thank you again for your time. I think you're probably the most underrated analyst on all of YouTube. You do a really good job covering covering both sides of gold and silver, a more realistic picture, and same thing with cryptocurrencies. Well, thank you very much. I don't know who's doing the rating, but uh, we'll have to talk to those people. <laughs> well, I, that's me That's me personally about the rating because I've listened to a lot of different experts, and you know what? I think you're one of the best. Well, thank so. you very much, Jason. Thanks for having me on your channel tonight. And so this was Louis Camersano, uh, the self-proclaimed red pill for the red pilled. And if our listeners want to subscribe to your channel and follow more of your work, how do they do so? I've tried to expand to as many places as possible. I'll give you the complete list, I think. Uh, small gold on YouTube, small gold on BitChute, small gold on Twitter, small gold on Gab, small gold on Steemit, small gold on Minds.com, small gold on Google+. Plus. So I think that's it. If I missed a place. Have have you outsourced all this? People posting you found an intern to do this? No. <laughs> that sounds no. like a lot of work. It, it, it is. But, you know, you do have the share buttons on your um, on the posts. And there's small gold at smallgold.com. That's the best place to go. Great. Well, uh, thank you again for your time. And I look forward to our next discussion in about three or four months. Thanks, Jason. Please like this video. Share it with friends and family. And don't forget to subscribe to the Wall Street for Main Street YouTube channel if you have not already done so. Thanks for helping Wall Street for Main Street pass the 20,000 YouTube channel subscriber milestone despite YouTube censorship. Hopefully, we'll be able to get to 30,000 or even 40,000 YouTube channel subscribers quickly if YouTube doesn't shut down this channel. If YouTube does shut down this channel, Remember to also sign up for the Wall Street for Main Street email list that's on the wallstreetformainstreet.com website and will tell you where the videos are going to be uploaded instead of YouTube. Also, if you really like the content and you decide that you want to give a one-time donation, you can go to the wallstreetformainstreet.com website where there's different options for you to do so. Or you can become a Patreon contributor. Thanks for listening and I look forward to providing my loyal listeners with some of the best information analysis, and financial education available out there, free or paid, as I work to grow the podcast and also get my educational technology company funded.